You will stay where you are. You will not move. We have some preparations to make, and then... Then something very odd happened. Half of Dr. Marlowe came alive. His right side first, his right eye lighting up while his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitching while his left hand remained stiff. Half of him came alive. Only half. Theater 5 presents Terror from Beyond. What's that? Did someone... Remember! Try and remember! Sir, you will not remember. Do you understand? When we are gone, it will be gone. As if it had never happened. And you will not remember. But you've got to remember, John! You've got to! The whole future of mankind, of life on Earth, depends on it! You've got to! I sat up in bed, listening. The surf was pounding at the foot of the cliff, but that was all. Had I really heard something or just imagined it? I didn't know. All I knew was I was in a cold sweat. But that wasn't surprising after what had happened, the deaths and... Deaths? But they'd been accidents. Maybe if I went back over it from the beginning... That's right, John! Start back at the beginning! Then maybe you'll remember! And you've got to! You've got to! When was the beginning? When I arrived at the base, I suppose. Went to the administration building for that first briefing session with Dr. Marlowe and Roy. Oh, it's good to see you again, John. It's good to see you, Doctor. Great to have you aboard, John. Did you mind our doing this, pulling strings to have you assigned up here for a while? Are you kidding? You said it was something interesting. We think it is. As interesting and important as any space work that's being done anywhere today. I know. We'll be putting a man on the moon in a few years, but... If we're to go on from there, one of the things we should know is what we're likely to find. In other words, whether there's intelligent life anywhere in the solar system. Mm -hmm. That's why I hated leaving the old project. You haven't. <laughs> this is still part of the old project. Uh, remember what our problem was on Van Gogh? Of course. A radio telescope can pick up any message from out there that might be beamed at us, but it's sometimes very difficult to tell precisely where it's coming from. Exactly. Well, we're using a technique here that'll take care of that. A light beam, rather than radio waves. You mean a laser? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, we discussed that. We've already hit the moon with a beam no bigger than a pencil, but suppose you do establish a contact, how do you get your feedback, your response? Well, we believe we've solved that problem, uh, theoretically at least. But we needed an electronic specialist to work on it with us. That's why we requested you. When do we start? Right away. Uh, by the way, you're sharing a cottage with Roy. Now, why don't you go on down there with him? Drop your luggage, we'll get to work. The work. I remember that. Weeks of it. Finally, the big night. The night of our first test. It was clear and cool. The ocean still, not thundering, but whispering at the base of the cliffs as if it were waiting. All the stars sharp and clear like signposts on the road to the infinite. Dr. Marlowe at the computer, Roy and I at the center console. Team minus two. Check. By the way, Doctor, I meant to ask you before, what made you pick Damus as our first target? Well, it was a few weeks after you left the project. We got a message from there. No. Well, there was some question about it, John. First, as to whether it was really was a coherent message, and second, as to whether it was from Damus. The British got a fix on it, too. And it was on the hydrogen wavelength, the one we always said anyone out there would use. That's true. And even though we never got another one, I 
thought it was worth exploring further. Of course, but that's fantastic. Yes, it's an exciting prospect. But it's also a rather frightening one. Why do you say that? We're reaching out, John. We're getting close to the secret of matter, the origin of life, the mystery of the universe. Sometimes I become a little afraid. Afraid that we may stumble onto something that's too much, too big for us. T minus 10 seconds. Check. Power on. Give me a reading, John. Vector 9. 18.2 and steady. Time. How long to contact? Three minutes, 28 seconds. We sat there tensely, watching our instruments on the clock. Then... There it is, the feedback. We've done it. The trick now will be to maintain contact. Oh, wait a minute. What's that? It sounds like a pattern. Listen. Even numbers. Now odd numbers. Great Scott, do you think we've got something? Follow it. Follow it. Start with an even series. We started following the pattern, and we got nothing. We kept at it all night, most of the next day. Still nothing. Wait. The next night, it's starting to come back to me now. I remember. I remember. It was the sound of the generators that woke me. It was about two in the morning. I padded out along the duck boards to the control building. The lights were on. I went in. And there was Dr. Marlowe. He was sitting at the control panel, and he was strange. His eyes were open, but he didn't seem to see me. Dr. Marlowe? Dr. Marlowe, what is it? What are you doing? Dr. Marlowe! Then something very odd happened. Half of him came alive. His right side first. His right eye lighting up while his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitched while his left one remained stiff. And then... What? Oh, oh hello, John. Is uh, anything the matter, Doctor? No. Why should anything? Hey, what am I doing here? Doctor... Have you ever walked in your sleep before? Oh, not that I know of. Of course, I haven't been sleeping too well lately. Rather disturbing dreams, but... John, did you change this beam frequency? No, Doctor. You must have done it in your sleep. Shall I switch it back? No. Cut the power, but leave it. I'd like to look at it again in the morning. Do some thinking about it. Somehow, neither of us mentioned it the next day. We just went on with our work, collecting data, trying for another contact, if it had been a contact. And that night, yes, it was that night that we discovered what it meant. The generators woke me again. I looked at my watch. It was almost three o'clock, and for some reason, I was terrified. The door of Roy's room was open. As I went by, I saw that his bed was empty. Then I was walking along the duck boards to the control building. The lights were on again. I looked in through the window. Dr. Marlowe was at the panel as he'd been the night before with that same dead look on his face. And Roy was standing in front of him, talking to him. I could hear him through the window. Dr. Marlowe. Dr. Marlowe, what is it? Is anything wrong? He's asleep. Walking in his sleep. Better get John. He started toward the door. Then, apparently deciding he'd better not leave the generators on, he turned and went toward the master switch. And as he did, Dr. Marlowe moved. His face still dead, expressionless. He got up, took a heavy wrench, and followed Roy. Then, just as Roy put out a hand to throw the switch, he hit him. I saw Roy's body crumple to the floor. I stood there, frozen, unable to move. Dr. Marlowe looked down at him for a moment with no sign of emotion on his face. Then, like a zombie, he went over to the workbench again, picked up an odd assortment of tools, and returned to Roy's body. He bent over him, looking at him as if he were a laboratory specimen. 
And as I realized what he was going to do, my paralysis left me. I shouted and started for the door, but just before I reached it, I tripped, hit my head, and that was the last I knew. I'm not sure how long I was out, but when I came to, I was lying in front of the door and a dark shape was bending over me. John, what happened? Keep away from me. Don't touch me. I saw what you did in there. And where? When? Just now, in the control room, to Roy. What do you mean? I just came up here from my cottage. I had a bad dream, came out to get some air, and I found you lying here. But I tell you, I saw you, and... And what? I, I must have imagined it, dreamed it, because I thought I saw you kill him. We looked everywhere, but there was no sign of Roy. Then we hurried back to the control building and searched it again. He's not here either, John. No. Must be in my mind. Of course, if it had really happened, there'd be something, if not his body, at least his blood. Where, John? Where would it be? Right here, in front of the master switch. But there's nothing. No. Except that the floor is wet. Looks as if it's been scrubbed. Hey, you're right. John. Did you change the beam frequency this way? No, Doctor. You must have done it just the way you did last night. Last night? You mean something happened last night, too? You don't remember? No, no. Tell me what you thought you saw happen tonight, whether you believe it or not. Well, you were sitting at the control panel with your eyes open, but as if you were asleep. Yes. The generators were on, and the beam frequency was set the way it is now. Roy was speaking to you, but you didn't answer him. Then when he started to cut the power, you picked up a wrench and hit him. I hit Roy? But that's not the worst of it. After that, you picked up some tools and bent over him as if... Well, as... as if he were a laboratory animal. Telling you about it now, I know the whole thing's mad. It's impossible. I wonder. You mean it could have happened some way? Without your knowing it? In the old project. And in this one. We've been listening for messages from out of space, trying to determine whether intelligent life exists anywhere in our galaxy. John, if it did exist, what form would it take? Well, it wouldn't necessarily look like us with two arms and legs. Exactly. And, and suppose it existed in a totally different form, in the form of electrical energy. Electrical energy? Why not? Isn't that the way the brain functions? Giving off electromagnetic waves? And what do we know about Deimos? Suppose, suppose living beings existed there in the form of complex electrical charges and a channel were suddenly opened between it and the Earth. Our laser beam. Mm. You mean they could travel down and take hold of someone, you, I'm and I'm then... speculating, John. Of course, even if it's true, we don't know if these entities are malevolent, dangerous or not. When they killed, made you kill Roy? Because he was going to shut off the transmitter, cut off contact with their base. As for the rest, well, they'd be very interested in the human body, particularly the brain. They'd want to examine it, study it. Do you realize what you're saying, suggesting, Doctor? Intelligences from outer space, another world, the taking over of a man's body by forces yes, that we... Yes, John, I know what I'm saying. And while I'm only hypothesizing. I don't really believe it's possible. Do you own a gun? Yes. So happens I do. Well, start carrying it. And if you notice me doing anything strange, don't hesitate. Shoot. And shoot to kill. I didn't go back to sleep that night. And I was convinced that I would never sleep again. Because it would be then that it would be easiest for them to... No, no, I can't think about it. I won't, even now. I felt a little better in the morning. I went over to have another talk with Dr. Marlowe. But he wasn't at his cottage. He wasn't anywhere on the base. And no one seemed to know where he was. Then I called Colonel Gately at headquarters. No one there knew anything about Dr. Marlowe or Roy. But by that time... Something had happened to me. It had all become blurred, like an old nightmare that you know was frightening, but whose details you can't remember. About a week later, the colonel called me 
and asked me to meet him at the police station in the town nearby. You knew Swanson pretty well, didn't you, Parker? Yes, of course. Some fishermen found a body in their nets this morning. We'd like you to look at it. Oh? All right. Brace yourself. Here. Good Lord. I... I can't be certain, but... I'm fairly sure it's Roy. How did he die? We'll have to wait for the coroner's report, but my guess is that he fell off the cliff. And Dr. Marlowe? Nothing new on him yet, but if they were together, his body may turn up soon, too. He was a better prophet than he knew, because Dr. Marlowe came back that very night. I'd taken something to make me sleep. It was the only way I could sleep, but the sound of the generators woke me. I took my gun, went to the control building. The lights were on. I opened the door, and there was Dr. Marlowe. He was standing near the console, his face thin and drawn, and his eyes blank. And when he spoke, his voice was hardly human, as if someone was speaking through him. It is unfortunate that you awakened Parker, and even more unfortunate that you came in here. What do you mean, Doctor? Where have you been, and why are you talking so strangely? We have been looking over your planet, studying it and its life, particularly you so-called humans. We have found it very interesting. And now, we are ready to go. Go? Go where? Wait. You said we. Dr. Marlowe, have they... You will stay where you are. You will not move. We have some preparations to make. And then... A voice, that horrible voice, broke off. And Dr. Marlowe swayed as if he were about to fall. I grabbed him, held on to him. And then his eyes changed, came alive. And when he spoke again, it was with his own voice. John, John for heaven's sake, help me. What? They got me. They took me that night. Took me all over the country, looking, examining, studying. They picked my brain, John. And now they're going to take me with them. Take you? Back to where they come from. Not my body. They're not interested in that. But the essential me. And in heaven's name, shoot, John. Shoot me! And now we are ready. Look here at his eyes. Look closely. Yes, like that. As your friend told you, we are taking him with us. But you will not remember what has happened. You will remember nothing. Do you understand? Because someday, we may come back. I stood there, frozen, holding Marlowe. Suddenly, he broke my grip, pushed me away. Walking stiffly and mechanically, he went to the door, opened it, and went out along the duck boards to the edge of the cliff. Then, without hesitating, he stepped over the edge and disappeared. Now do you remember, John? It's all true! They exist! And they've got me here! Not only that, but they may return to Earth again for others! And... John, they're coming back now! They're coming! Do something! <laughs> When I woke up about a half hour ago, I found this all written out on the pad I keep next to my bed. I remember some of what I'd written, but other parts, like Roy's murder and Dr. Marlowe's death, I don't recall at all. Either I'm mad, completely mad, or... No, no, I can't think about that. In any case, if I showed this to anyone, the world would think I was mad. There's only one thing to do. Tear it up. Every last page of it. Every last page of it. Every last page of it. Theater 5 has presented Terror from Beyond. 
Written by Robert Newman and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Robert Dryden, Ralph Camargo, and Gilbert Mack. Audio engineers Marty Folia and Bill Sandreuter. Sound technicians Ed Blaney and M.C. Brock. Original music composed by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. This is Fred Foy speaking. <laughs>